The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. I'm Chris Beckenbaugh. My guest from the Nebraska Better Business Bureau shares Aging Partners' goal of keeping adults prepared for their future. One thing that can really change someone's financial future is being taken advantage by scam artists. Jim Hegarty, president of the Nebraska Better Business Bureau, is my guest today, and he will have some stories that will make you shake your head about the way people take advantage of seniors in our community. That's, Welcome, Jim. Well, thanks, Chris, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Jim, you and I have met and you shared some stories with me about some scams that seniors might be prey to. Uh, there are three basic types of scams that are currently being reported in this area. Can you share those with us? Sure. Well, at the BBB, we receive calls on a daily basis from consumers and businesses uh, in our three-state service area that have been victimized in some way by a scheme or a scam. Unfortunately, uh, the largest audience and the group that really seems to be in the bullseye of the scammers, many of whom reside offshore, are our senior population. And we think there's some good reasons for this. Uh, the senior population is often home. Uh, uh, the scammers' view of them is this, that they may have some disposable income uh, that's accessible. Uh, and I think also the scammers are hoping that, uh, depending on the age of the individuals, they may be slightly compromised and maybe not making the greatest decisions. Uh, so uh, the scammers are obviously trying to exploit the vulnerability of our senior population. Um, probably the largest scheme that we see consistently year after year that probably more uh, adults and seniors uh, fall for are foreign lottery and sweepstakes scams. And, and the way that these materialize is usually uh, you receive a piece of mail uh, that notifies you that it's your lucky day, uh, that you're the winner, uh, and that you've won an enormous prize. And oftentimes the scammers will hijack legitimate logos from Reader's Digest, Publisher's Clearinghouse, to, and, and also the BBB logo to lend legitimacy to their scam. The scammers often reside in Jamaica, Nigeria, Costa Rica, uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. They'll send tens of thousands of these mailings into zip codes in Nebraska. Uh, so these arrive simultaneously all over our service area. Uh, and it's really a fishing expedition. So the seniors open up the envelope. They're notified they've won this huge prize. And then they're given some very specific and sophisticated instructions that they need to call the agent that's controlling their prize, their winnings. They, they make that phone call. And then they're instructed uh, to take the check that's included in the envelope, deposit it into their bank account, uh, and then wait 12 to 14 hours, withdraw a smaller amount, and then wire that to wherever the scammers might be located and the wire transfer seniors are told is to cover the taxes or the processing fees in order for their prize to be delivered to their homes by courier. So many people fall for this scam. Uh, they, they take the check, they go over to their bank, they put it in, the bank accepts the check because the checks look very legitimate. So the senior is under the impression that uh, this must be real, mm -hmm. uh, it must be authentic, uh, the check was actually good, uh, and they believe that that money, maybe $4,000 that they've deposited into their bank account, is there. So they'll withdraw 3000 of that 4000 and then go to a Western Union office, maybe uh, at, a, at a, ca a check cashing facility or Walmart. They'll wire $3,500. Uh, and then they wait for their prize, the prize doesn't come, and then they're notified that the check that they deposited bounced, and then the reality sets in that the money they wired was their own, and they're out that money. Mm. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, seniors that get on uh, the hook of these scammers uh, will continue to be engaged. The scammers will call back. They'll say that there was a problem with our courier. We need some more fees. There's taxes that have to be paid. And this can go on and on. I've been in the home of 84-year-old uh, women who've wired off over $40,000 uh, in a three-month period. Recently, uh, the Better Business Bureau was contacted by an 87-year-old couple that notified us that they have been engaged with scammers from Canada over the past three years and have been trying to collect their $875,000 prize. 
and in that three years they have sent over 153 wire transfers. Many of these represent wire transfers that were for thousands of dollars, many for $500. The grand total of, this, of the losses to this 87-year-old couple, 150 or so wire transfers totaling $135,000 over a three-year period of okay, time. Okay, so this is one couple, one couple dealing with one company. One scammer. Trying to get $800,000 and they spent one hundred and thirty-five of a hundred, $135,000. Of trying, their own money. Right, and they were, they were called probably over a three-year period, maybe 150 to 160 times by the scammers. Uh, they were told often that the calls were from IRS agents. Uh, the IRS agents were notified that they hadn't collected their prize. They were going to call somebody else, and then another call would come. They were told that the plane with the suitcase with their winnings was in Grand Island. They needed to send money uh, for the airport landing fees, and it went on and on and on. And obviously, this couple was compromised. Uh, or they wouldn't have stayed mm -hmm. engaged in the scheme for as long as they did. But this is what the scammers are looking for. They're looking for people that have the money, mm -hmm. uh, that are vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, and who obviously want to believe that they've won. Pretty sad. That is a very sad story. But I know that you have others as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so the, the sweepstakes scheme is ongoing, and every day, as we are speaking right now, uh, mail has arrived in the mailboxes of people all over Nebraska, uh, letting them know that they are the, it's their lucky day, that they're mm -hmm. the winner. So obviously, you know, what we want people to know is, is that these are always schemes, they are always scams, and no legitimate lottery or sweepstakes or any kind of a prize offer would ever require you to send any money to collect your prize. So that's the absolute number one red flag, never are you ever required to send money or pay money in order to collect your prize? And certainly if it involves a wire transfer of cash, particularly offshore, mm -hmm. these are the huge red flags that people watch for. So Kay. the scammers know that we're on TV, we're in the paper, we're on the radio mm -hmm. all the time, usually on a, a semi-monthly basis. We are talking about this and we're warning people about this. So what they do is they essentially reinvent the scam mm -hmm. to look a little bit differently. So one of the ways they do this is what we call the grandparent scam, which is a very prevalent scam that's occurring in the Midlands and particularly in Nebraska. Not a week goes by that our bureau office doesn't receive a call from a Nebraska senior who has received a call, and this is what the call sounds like, Grandma, mm -hmm. Grandpa, and that's the way that it begins. Mm -hmm. Their hope is, is that the grandparent will say, is this Johnny? Or is this Jim, one of their adult grandchildren? So now the scammers know the name of the adult grandchildren. And then the scheme begins. The grandchild says, yes, Grandma, it is Jim, and I've got some bad news. I'm on spring break with my friends up here in Quebec, uh, and we were drinking um, or we were smoking marijuana. Uh, we got in an accident. We were pulled over. We've been arrested. We're in the hospital. Uh, and we need some help. Uh, and I've got a law enforcement official here that would like to talk to you or an attorney that would like to talk to you. Then they hand the phone to another individual and they begin to try to convince this grandparent that their, their older grandchild is in trouble in a foreign country, either arrested or injured, and that they need money either to pay legal fees or medical bills um, in order to get their grandchildren released back to the United States. The grandchildren get back on the phone and beg the grandparents not to contact their parents. Mm -hmm. Could we keep this secret? And obviously, many grandparents who love their grandchildren, who believe that their grandchild is in trouble, are going to be eager to want to help them. And unfortunately, many of them run off to Western Union wire the three or four or five thousand dollars to the scammers to rescue their grandchildren who are probably right here in their hometown. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is uh, uh, obviously a very uh, sophisticated approach. The scammers are very good at what they do. I recently had a call uh, from a gentleman uh, that I know through my church. 
Uh, he left a message at my office and he said, Jim, I need you to call me. I've had a very bad day. I called him back uh, and he said, Jim, it's been a terrible day. My grandson Jake was arrested up in Canada. He was with his buddies on a vacation. He was arrested. Jim, it was just horrible. I talked to Jake on the phone and I said to him, I said, Dan, tell me that you didn't wire any money. Tell me that you didn't do this. I guarantee you that Jake's not in Canada. And he said, oh no, I'm telling you, it was Jake. I know Jake and it sounded just like him. Uh, and Dan had already gone to U.S. Bank, uh, withdrawn $3,900 in cash, and then gone to a grocery store service counter and had already wired the $3,900 oh. away. That was at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. I immediately got in my car. I drove to that grocery store. Uh, I encountered uh, the customer service folks. They remembered Dan. Uh, and we were able to get a hold of Western Union and discover that the scammers had not picked up the three thousand, the thirty-nine hundred dollars up in uh, Vancouver, and and red, and they were able to put a red flag on it, stop the deal, and we were able to unwind that. And Dan was able to go back to that grocery store that evening and get his thirty-nine hundred dollars back. And I'm still waiting for him to buy me dinner. <laughs> uh, well, that's a terrific victory. Unfortunately, most people are not that fortunate, are they? Yeah, almost. In every case, it is impossible for us to unwind these deals and to get the money back. And often, and, and you know, many people will call and they'll say, uh, "Please, you know, why can't you ever recover any of the losses? Why can't you track these scammers down?" Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, is that these are individuals who are walking around with prepaid cell phones, stolen cell phones. Their couriers have stolen ID. Uh, once the money's wired, it can be picked up at a variety of locations. So there isn't some place where we can go and wait for them to show up. However, uh, we are working closely with Western Union, with MoneyGram, and with outlets such as Walmart mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that provide services that allow these wire transfers to take place. And in some cases, we have had reports where Walmart employees or Western Union employees are stopping seniors and saying, are you sure you want to do this? Are you aware of all of the schemes and the scams are out there? So occasionally we get some good news, but more often than not, and unfortunately, the news is usually not good. Uh, and the bad news is, is that it's escalating. I just did a piece uh, in the Omaha World Herald about our 10 sort of most prevalent schemes and scams that mm -hmm. occurred in 2011. And I'd like to say that we got some of them stopped, but the bottom line is in almost every case, these scams are escalating and they're becoming more and more sophisticated. Well, I appreciate the work that you're doing to help seniors in Nebraska and South sure. Dakota and Iowa. I, I know you brought along this, the right. file of life. Right. Uh, you want to tell us just briefly about that? Sure. We're working with uh, fire and rescue departments all over our service area to, uh, to provide these magnets, which can be uh, placed on the refrigerators um, in seniors' homes, uh, and it contains sensitive medical information so that if paramedics would show up on an emergency call, they'd have the sensitive data, medical information that they might have to have for that senior to treat them in the event that they're compromised in some way. But it also contains our BBB senior line, which is the fraud line we've established specifically for seniors to call in the event that they've received a, a mm -hmm. strange piece of mail or a weird phone call, or for many seniors who are now online on the internet mm -hmm. uh, creating Facebook sites so that they can interact with their grandchildren. Uh, we want them to, before they take the bait, uh, or respond to any of these schemes or scams to call the BBB. And the number is 877-637-3334, toll free. Uh, and it's pretty easy to uh, just dial us up. And we have first responders that man our phones that are themselves seniors, um, that are really there trained to be responsive to the types of calls that they might get from folks uh, who are on the verge or on the edge of falling prey to one of these schemes. So they just need to contact the Better Business Bureau to get a file of life and that'll have the information and, and the number that they need to call. That's right. And we'll get them, we'll get refrigerator magnets sent out to them and we'll take care of all the mailing costs uh, because we want them to be more informed about the decisions that they're making with their finances. Well, thank you so much. Let's hope we've prevented at least one, if not many, people losing their funds. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Join us as we return to Live and Learn.
What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake and you're watching Live and Learn. And today we have as our guest, former Governor Kay Orr. But before we talk to Kay, let's go back to those thrilling days of yesteryear to 1986 and the morning after the night she was named Governor of the state of Nebraska. Well, it's a race that uh, will go down in the history books. It was a very tough battle and a very close race, we think. And I'd like you to meet our <laughs> next our brand new governor, Kay Orr. Kay, congratulations. Thank you, Lita. You must be exhausted. Have you had any sleep at all? Oh, yes, about three hours. But as people have said to me in the waning days of the campaign, aren't you tired? And I said, I'll be tired the day after tomorrow when I go on vacation. When it all runs out. Let me ask you a question. A lot of money was spent. I mean, over a yes. million dollars on both sides. Is there a better way to do it? I'm thinking about those people who can't raise the million plus dollars necessary. And so therefore we eliminate some of the kinds of people who might be potentially fine candidates. Is there a better way to do it? No, I don't think so because it's a voluntary contribution that's made. It's an investment. And if you start limiting, uh, then you limit it perhaps to people who have personal wealth. If people don't have the ability to attract people with their ideas and the issues and what they stand for uh, and attract that money, they're not going to be a viable candidate anyway. So it's something that uh, some may have to work a little longer to build up that network of support. But I think it's a good system. And as expensive as it may be, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's an investment. It's less money we spend on many other things that we do in this mm -hmm. society. Kay, in, in the, the last part of the campaign, there was some mudslinging between you and Helen. Whose idea was that? Was that the, uh, the, the people who put together your campaign? Or why, why did you feel the need to do well, that? Well, there's been a great deal of talk. Uh, I mean, that word has been used, quote, mudslinging. Mm -hmm. But I think there has to be a closer examination of the message. What I talked about in my campaign, of course, were the issues of, that were facing Nebraskans, some of the problems that we face, and what I felt would be the solutions. In addition to that, I always talked factually, and I only talked about public statements that were, were made by my opponent and held them up for examination to the public. So I don't think that you can really characterize this campaign as being one of mudslinging. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Oh, I think we thought that perhaps there were no burning issues, really burning issues that galvanized the voters and that's why it came to a question of personalities. Well, I think we clearly uh, stood on many of the same issues, on the issues uh, with similar outlooks because we understood the concerns. We had priorities in education, doing something about our agricultural economy, wanting to capitalize on the assets that are here in Nebraska to move us forward. But there was a philosophical difference. Perhaps that was more difficult for us to communicate to the voters. Also, there's some time in, um, an unrealistic expectation among the voters that there's going to be some message that's set out in neon lights that uh, is going to be you know, clearly the difference between two candidates. Uh, but I think that is an unrealistic expectation on their part. How important was President Reagan's coming to Nebraska to you? Was that significant? Well, that's difficult for me to assess as well. I think we'll let some of the political analysts do that. I'm clearly known as a supporter of the president and, uh, and his philosophy um, and a loyalist to him. He's well regarded and respected in this state. Many, of course, try and point out what about the farm issue. Well, the farm issue is one that uh, is a product of Washington policy both by the administration and Congress. And as I traveled across the state and talked to those in agriculture, they were looking more for changes that needed to be made instead of pointing to any elected official, president or members of Congress, to say you know, they were wrong. Uh, they didn't want to hear a negative about that. They wanted to hear solutions. Mm -hmm. Any key appointments to announce this morning? Well, uh, the very first one to be made is to uh, appoint a chief of staff, and that man will be, uh, that position will go to Hans Brisch, who's been with me these past few months in the campaign, having been served as assistant to President Roskins at the university. Good. How important are newspapers coming out in favor of you? Like uh, the Omaha World Herald supported yes. you, the Lincoln Journal and Star supported 
uh, Helen. Is, is that significant? Well, I think it plays uh, an important part because it does say uh, that I have support in communities across the state. It's not the only factor. There are just so many important uh, parts of a successful campaign. Basically, the message that's delivered by the candidate, but I attribute most of my success to the fact that I was able to bring together 18,000 volunteers across the state who worked in their communities. Hindsight is always 2020, of course, yes. Kay. If, would you do anything differently than you did? Oh, there were some things left undone. And when you work with a volunteer organization like this, it's not a perfect beast by any means. But uh, we felt we put together a campaign and an organization unlike this state has ever seen, and we're just very, very proud, I am, of every single one of them. When are you going to go to sleep? Oh, in a couple of days. <laughs> in a couple of days. Are you going to take some time off now? Uh, my husband and I will leave on Friday, and we'll be gone for a week. And then, of course, there are, there's a big task ahead. Oh, so. yes. Well-deserved rest. Kay or congratulations. You've you. gone down in history. We're very proud of you. That was November the 4th, 1986, 26 years ago. How delighted we are to have Kay Orr with us today. And you know, I was so afraid you weren't going to show up that morning on the morning show because of the night you had before. It was a short one, that's for sure. And it, of course, it had been preceded by days and weeks of hard work. So I was, I was still going on fumes that morning. But it, it had to be more than that because the interesting thing is, you would be the first Republican female governor in the history of the United States. So therefore, all the news networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, were here. I mean, this was big news. It really did put Nebraska on the map, that whole campaign. And of course, Helen Busalis was a part of that as well. The first time Nebraska ever had, or any state had ever had two women vying for the governorship. So. Nebraska. I know. <laughs> and that state right out there, how could they steal that from for history? <laughs> okay, speaking of Helen Busalis, I saw you two on an elephant ride going to Pershing Auditorium when the circus came to town. You want to tell us about that? Who, whose idea was that? Well, I'm really not certain. Maybe you can help me fill in on that. I just know I got a phone call that I was challenged to ride the symbol <laughs> of my party from the station down to Pershing Auditorium. And my opponent hadn't let it be known that she was willing to do that. She kind of threw the challenge out. That's how it got to me. Well, I think that's, that's really cute because the circus usually came to town and that's what they usually did. Right. But was Helen Mayer at that time, Helen Busellas? Was well, she, the she was the candidate at that time. At that time. Right. Well, I think that was very generous of her because an elephant representing yes. the Republican Party and you got to ride on the elephant. I wonder how she felt after she got up on top of that elephant <laughs> because when I got up there, I thought, oh my, <laughs> nobody told me about campaigns, what we were going to get ourselves into. And that <laughs> elephant is really tall. It's a long way down to oh, the cement ground. Did you feel that. the hair, that firm? hair on the back of the elephant. Were you aware of that prickly hair? Well, just slightly. I was more looking at first for the rope that was up there <laughs> to hang on to. And then once that elephant started down the street, there's a gate to it. Yeah. So, And it's so big and comfortable that I really had a good time. Yeah. Well, there's actually a lope. I call it a lope. And as yeah. the elephant lopes along and you're on the top, you lope too. And then when you get to a certain point, you think, oh, I could just keep going. <laughs> you remember the rope? You could hang on to the rope? Well, I'm just you didn't a little bit of a show off. So <gasps> I gave up the rope so I could do, you know, hand oh. waves on each side. Well, you were on your way to winning. <laughs> well, who knew at that point? <laughs> the nomination. <laughs> Speaking of winning, uh, we also have, have a picture of Kay with President Reagan. Uh -huh. And I happened to look at that picture and saw that it was signed by President Reagan. Yes. Yes. That ought to be worth two or three dollars, huh? Well, perhaps, but it's not going anywhere except in the family <laughs> archives. I, I wish that I'd had a tape on my uh, phone over at the cabin when he called me and uh, spoke to me about chairing the Republican Platform Committee. And uh, you've perhaps heard the reputation of the White House operators, that they can find anybody at any time in the world. Right at the day after the election, uh, probably in the afternoon, since I was so busy with you in the morning, I was at our campaign headquarters, and it was in the lower level of the centrum, and there was a beauty shop across the hall. 
and they came over to say, would you please stay off the phone because President Reagan is trying to call Kaor oh. to congratulate her. So he was calling you, how marvelous. Oh, yes, <laughs> but did those White House operators really had, that was before the days you had the internet and white pages and all those tools to which you could track down people. But well, speaking of, well, who were you pointing at in that particular picture? Do you remember? I Because it's a great remember. picture and very direct. Oh, there were 15,000 people there, but I obviously saw somebody I knew <laughs> that was special. But now, you got to go to the White House and have, have uh, dinner with President Reagan yes. and, I, and Margaret Thatcher, yes. uh, the Prime Minister of England. And yes. where did Bill, your husband, where was he seated? Well, he was actually at a table near mine. He was seated with Dennis Thatcher and... Admiral Crow, who was head of the chief of staff, but as we entered the room where the dining <coughs> takes place, we're each given a little envelope with the table number on it, and Bill's table number was four, and mine was 11. And I thought, oh, did he get a better table than I did, a lower <laughs> number? So I'm searching around, and I find that table 11 is President Reagan's table. And, of course, his guest of honor was on his right, but I was seated on his left, ah. which gave me an instant momentary status in that room with all those notable people because there was only one other governor there, the governor of California, mm -hmm. President Reagan's home state, and Supreme Court justices and famous movie stars and and K just people. <laughs> and K yeah. Did you get a chance to talk to Margaret Thatcher? Yes, briefly, but I'll tell you, President Reagan and Mrs. Thatcher were really, really right. deep in conversation. I got to talk to my dinner partner who on my left, who was Oral Hershiser, who had just won the World Series as a pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Ah. And when he sat down next to me, I hadn't a clue who he was. He had to tell me. Well, I wondered if you saw the movie um, about Margaret Thatcher, Iron Lady, yet with Meryl Streep? Haven't seen to it see yet. It, you, well, you go and see the movie just to see if you know she really does look like and sound like. Uh, I've Margaret seen Thatcher. some of the trailers, and it's a very impressive performance. Uh, very impressive. Well, what a night for you! It was very special in many, many ways. There are other stories with that night too, with Tom well, Selleck and and Loretta Young. What about and Tom? Sills. Tell me about Tom Selleck. Well, Tom Selleck was invited to our inaugural, Ooh. and he notified us about two weeks before that he was not able to attend. And I told my staff at that time, state treasurer's office, oh, I know he would have come. If only he'd gotten the word. I'm sure his people just didn't give him the invitation. Well, that night at the White House, Bill and I had met Tom Selleck. Isn't at he the, handsome? At the, oh, yes. <laughs> had his mother with him. His wife oh. was pregnant. We met him in the reception. And then, of course, I was seated at the president's table, and Tom Selleck came up afterwards, and he said, you know, Kay, I've been thinking about the time we corresponded. He said, I couldn't come because I was both acting and directing in Magnum P.I., and for uh, him to remember that, it, I thought yeah. was incredible. He, he is an extraordinary guy. He's very and kind speaking and Speaking of nice. extraordinary guys, her husband, Bill, yes. is quite extraordinary. And also, I, I wonder if you have a copy of the cookbook that he, he put together, the, the first gentleman's cookbook. And I think it sold at the time for $12.25. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is this still in print? No, it is not. I think people can purchase it on the internet, I think, on some of those, uh, I know some people have recently. And what, what was Bill's favorite recipe in here? Do you recall? Well, I think he would probably claim the meatloaf, which he renamed <laughs> the governor's loaf, which he did on the Regis and Kathy show live. For a man who didn't cook, he certainly got himself a reputation, didn't he? <laughs> With that cookbook. <laughs> he must have cooked something, though. <laughs> well, he made the governor's loaf, and he did chili. <laughs> and he did a decent potato salad, and that was about it. But you see, Lita, there's that handsome guy. I On the front of this I cookbook, they sold 20,000 copies. Oh. And all these women think that I'm married to this man that goes out in the kitchen and just, you know, throws Whips these. Whips up these things. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, no. wasn't this used as a fundraiser? Yes. And for what purpose, do you recall? For the mansion. It was just to open the door so that uh, 
people would gain a greater understanding of the needs that we had to refurbish that mansion. Yeah, it was get looking a little tacky. Well, I think the most um, creditable uh, message we sent out was when the dining room drapes are literally falling apart, the fabric <laughs> ripping. But then, of course, Diane Nelson um, picked up the ball and ran with it, did a fabulous job of getting it. Now, redone. I know the woman who put this together, Pam Holloway, Holloway. Aichi, yes. was an extraordinary woman. Yes. And she served in your administration, did she not? No, she simply helped Bill with the cookbook. Bill knew Pam with his work at Business Woodman Accident and Life. Mm -hmm. And I would come back from the office in the evening, and I know Bill was getting together with his people on the cookbook because I'd see evidence of the peanuts left <laughs> and, the, and the little goodies and maybe glasses of this or whatever. And I'd say, Bill, how's the cookbook coming? Oh, fine. We've got the 501c3. We're moving along. And after a few meetings like that, I said, Bill, you're never going to get that cookbook done until you get a woman. Ah. He called Pam. Oh. Pam said, I thought you'd never call. Oh. That was such a great story because I get teary about yeah. this. Pam put that together in her last days before she died of breast cancer. So she got it published with Bill's, uh, she helped Bill get it published before she died. Pam would get that done before mm -hmm. she died. She yeah. was very special. Woman. And she was very pleased to do it because it just kept her occupied at, those, at that yeah. difficult time. Yeah, well, we think highly of her and so glad that she was involved yes. with that. Uh, also, in People Magazine, Bill and she were featured with regard to this cookbook. And the interesting thing about this is, I remember a picture of Bill. I still laugh when I think about it. Oh. When you were at the podium, and Bill, as the first gentleman, was standing behind you hold, holding your purse. purse. I love that. Now, uh, tell us about this story in People Magazine and, and what they were interested in. Well, again, with the campaign, uh, the national attention that we got with two women running and with me being the first Republican woman, the national press then were smart enough to think, well, the first woman governor of Nebraska, that means her husband, he has a unique role yeah. to play. And I think they found very quickly that Bill adapted to center stage <laughs> <laughs> very quickly and loved it. And so he got, uh, that's why People Magazine came out, not so much for me, is to interview Bill. Well, and Bill then Regis and Kathy had him on to do his meatloaf. <coughs> Bill worried about the House while you worried about right. the Senate. That was an extraordinary now, story. Now, I do understand when he was introduced to people for the first time and they would ask him what he did for a living. He always told them he was a full-time taxpayer. <laughs> so I had a sense of humor. Well, speaking of a sense of humor, Paul Fell, the cartoonist for the Lincoln Journal star for many, many years, also lampooned a lot of people, including Kay Orr and mm. Bill Orr. And uh, we have a picture we'd like to show you when you're talking about humor. Mm. And guess who's back? Bob Carey is back. But this cartoon, if you look closely, right at the top of the door, the wolves are howling out there. And to me, and of course he says on there, here are the keys to the office, and uh, shakingly, good, good luck, luck. <laughs> good luck to you. Now, what were the issues facing you at the, at the time you took over from Bob Carey? Well, when uh, Bob Carey left office, we were just at the end of the ag recession. Yeah. So he had, uh, those last couple of years, he was in office, difficulty meeting the budget requirements that were being made upon state government. And so we had to kind of pinch for the first year, but then there was a turnaround in the ag econ in the, our whole economy. And uh, I will say that we contributed, my administration contributed the turnaround by job creation. So, but it was a first, uh, first year was difficult. Well, during that first year, you got some perks as being the governor, one of which was a pass to the Nebraska State uh, Fair. Fun. Fun. And Fun. we have a picture of Kay at the State Fair. That looks like, is that the Tilt-A-Whirl or what is that? I believe that is the Tilt-A-Whirl. There wasn't a ride that my daughter Suzanne, who has her arms extended in the air, she and I would, would turn down. We loved them all. 
And of course, you can see I'm hanging on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> look but at that laughing. Leg. Look at laughing. Your, look at your right leg. <laughs> I know it's it's fine. But that reminds me not just to the rides on the state fair. And there'll be a trooper that will remain nameless that that uh, had to go on one of the rides with me and then had to go home sick afterwards. <laughs> but um, that reminds me of the jet rides that I got to take, Lita. The what? Jet rides. Oh, the, oh, 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 yes. oh, 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 tell me about that. Well, Commander in Chief of the Air and Army National Guard, I got to ride in the F-4s three times and then General Chain in Omaha Strategic Air Command off at Air Force Base let me ride in F-16. So, so the, with the Blue Angels? Those, no, those are, the Blue Angels are Navy. Oh, you that's know, right. Air Force. Yes, my, uh, yes. So that's all right. Yes. That's all right. So and how fast did you go? As fast as the plane will go. <laughs> and I did as many things as it would do. It was great. <laughs> okay. Well, we want to shine the light on K or now, do you recall this? Ah, uh, this uh -huh. little flashlight says on her, the spotlight is on K. Orr, the governor's inaugural, January the 9th, 1987. How did this come about? Was this, a, I'm surprised, was, uh, was this a surprise to you? It was a surprise. Somebody in the, in the inaugural committee thought up the idea that they would turn the lights down and then when Bill and I would, were announced and stepped out on stage, everybody in the audience would shine those lights. And so when we came out, it was like little stars sparkling. Uh -huh. It was beautiful. You didn't know it was going to happen? No, I did not know. Well, it's really interesting because uh, I was telling my neighbor that I was going to be chatting with you, and he said, I attended her inaugural, and I've got some things. I said, what? And he brought this over. I said, oh, what on sakes. earth is this? He said, well, we all shine the light on her. And the funniest thing about this little thing is I looked at it and thought, well, now this was January 1987. Right. I looked at this and I said, it's a paper clip. Yeah, or how, so, something, what is it? How practical, <laughs> see, it's a practical thing. You know, Nebraskans have to You do. were going to have a practical administration. Right. <laughs> I don't know, so well, Kay, it's been so delightful to talk to you again after, after these Thank many you. years. And how, how is Bill doing, and how are you doing, and what are you doing with your life? Well, I'm, this is the best time of life for me, being a grandmother, and I have five of my seven grandchildren, two blocks from me, five oh. boys. And so I'm very much, Bill and I are very much involved in their lives. But also, I'm a trustee of Hillsdale College, which is where our oldest grandson, Taylor, graduated two years ago. Second grandson's a junior. Third grandson's going to be a freshman this year. And it's a great school. In where, where is the school? In Hillsdale, Michigan. And it's how? It's 148 years old. My goodness. Classical liberal arts school. And it's unique in that it accepts no state or federal funding. So it's totally self-endowed. And what are the kids majoring? Where are their interests Well, it's uh, the Taylor graduated in political science and history. Hmm. Alex is an art major. Will, who will attend this fall, he's in, he's in his second year studying Russian. He'll not be able to study that there, but he's in languages and probably music. But it's, again, it's the traditional, as universities used to be constituted, classical liberal arts school. Well, I bet they have some wonderful stories to tell about the oh, grandmother. Yes. <laughs> oh, well, we get along well. And Kay Orr has been our guest today on Live and Learn. We thank you okay. so very You're much. You're very welcome. Good to see you again. You're looking wonderful as usual. Oh, thank you. That's very and kind. And please join us again sometime. All right. All right. Thank you, Lita. And Live and Learn is going to return right after this <coughs> word. Dr. Ari Cycle here with a simple but important message. Recycling starts at home. That's right, it's up to you to take the first step. Setting up a home recycling system is easy and you don't need much space. Find out how at recycle.lincoln.ne.gov. Recycling is good for our community and our planet, and you don't need to be a genius like me to get started. So do the right thing, the recycle thing. Welcome back to Live and Learn. I'm Kristen Stowes. And I'm so happy to introduce my guest today, Dr. Marilyn Moore. Thank well, you, Christine. Welcome, Marilyn. It's good to be here. Dr. Moore is Associate Superintendent for Instruction at Lincoln Public Schools. 
In light of Dr. Moore's <coughs> retirement announcement, we thought it would be the perfect time to talk with her about the changes she has seen in education in Lincoln in the past 40 years, 25 of those years in her current position. Marilyn, could you please start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your hometown, your education? Sure. School's always been a part of my life. I grew up on a farm in southwest Nebraska in Red Willow County. I went to a small rural school and, and in that same high school through high school. And I remember playing school on the weekends and during the summer. So I always knew that I would be a teacher. I loved school. I loved my teachers. Uh, my mother had been a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse, and that was just what my future was going to be. I knew that. I, I don't think I knew all that it meant, and I don't know at all. I had no idea of what would be possible as a teacher, but I've always known I was going to be a teacher. So I came to the university when I graduated from high school and earned my undergraduate degree uh, with certification as a teacher of social studies for secondary students and started as a middle school teacher in 1972. And um, I really loved being a middle school teacher. I think being with young adolescents while they're growing up is just one of the most um, precious and tender moments in their lives. And it was truly an honor to be with them. At that time, when I was at Goodrich, we had students in grades six, seven, eight, nine. So I, I just had the, the true wonderful honor of seeing those sixth graders come in as still very much as children and leave four years later at the end of ninth graders well launched into, into adolescence and all the bumpiness that it took to get from sixth grade to ninth grade. So that was my start, truly a wonderful start. So you truly did do what your aspirations were. It's true. And you Always have carried wanted to be a teacher. it even further. Absolutely. And in fact, I still would describe myself in every role that I've had is that I am, I am a teacher. Most of the times now, um, instead of teaching middle school students, I'm teaching adults. And sometimes those are my colleagues. Sometimes those are the persons I supervise. Sometimes those are members of the community when I am asked to speak about Lincoln Public Schools or speak about educational issues. Sometimes it's policymakers who want more information as they're considering educational policy. But I think at, at its heart, my role is still that of a teacher. Oh, that's amazing. Well, during your career, I am sure you have seen so many changes. Mm -hmm. So I would like to mention just a few areas okay. and have you comment on each of okay. the changes you've seen in 40 years. First of all, changes in the school age population in Lincoln. Well, it's grown a lot. I, I really don't know how many students there were when I started teaching, but I know that when I started this job 25 years ago, we had right at 25,000 students, and now there are 36,000 students. Oh my goodness. So that's uh, almost a 50% increase in a 25-year time period. Mm -hmm. So the, the numbers have, have grown dramatically, and that's a reflection of Lincoln as a growing community. Absolutely. And the number of schools have certainly increased. Oh, the numbers of schools have increased again dramatically. I, I think when we started, we had, when I started in this job, we had about 44 schools and now we're at 55 and we'll open Clefcorn Elementary School next fall. And there's certainly the beginning talk about what will, what will be the needs for the next round of, of schools. Mm -hmm. when, when you add about six to 700 students every year, as we have done for a number of years, that's really adding the equivalent of another elementary school every year oh in our community. Goodness. That's amazing to keep up with. It is, yes, it is amazing. Yes. Now the types of subjects taught, have those changed over the years? Well, uh, there, are, there are some changes. There are some changes in names. Um, and some changes in content area also. Mm -hmm. I think in the whole area of what you and I would have called home economics, <laughs> that's now family and consumer science, um, there still is a lot of enrollment, especially in foods classes. Okay. I think the presence of all of the cooking shows on television <laughs> have inspired Absolutely. both our young men and young women to want to learn how to cook. Um, but there are also courses in that area, in the area of family dynamics and, and um, communication and conflict and um, family systems theory. Um, Family, uh, family parenting. We do teach classes sure. in parenting. Mm -hmm. Those are those are new content areas in in the last forty years. And then, of course, history itself, which was the area that I taught. There's forty years of history that our <laughs> teachers today are teaching that they didn't teach. Constantly when, growing. Constantly <laughs> growing field. And that's true in all the fields. Uh, the just the the leaps and bounds in the scientific knowledge, of course, mm -hmm. is is gigantic. And then. Um, then the whole area of technology. We teach courses in in um, computer science, in programming languages, in in um, multimedia with mm -hmm. as, at, with with uh, students having uh, the possibility of using technology that didn't truly did not right, exist. Right. So Keeping that's up with that is that's a lot. been another another Certainly. huge and growing area. Certainly. 
Now in the area of extracurricular activities, I know we always think of sports first, but that includes a whole many more things than just sports. It does. And in fact, from the time I started teaching, Title IX went into effect, and so the whole area of women's sports mm -hmm. has developed in Lincoln Public Schools since that time. And I was talking with um, some of our longtime teachers and coaches at the time of the, of the, the Girls and Boys State Basketball Tournaments just a few weeks ago, <laughs> and noting especially the growth in the skill level of girls uh -huh. as they play basketball. We were remembering the first girls basketball games when high school girls were playing and they never played. They didn't grow up bouncing a basketball and, and running and shooting and dribbling. They didn't, they didn't have those skills from the time right. they, were little, they were little girls. And now of course they do and they're amazing athletes, mm -hmm. just wonderful mm -hmm. athletes to watch. Mm -hmm. So it's been really fun watching the development of, of those wonderful opportunities for girls that mm -hmm. have existed for boys for such a long time. That's right. And then um, beyond the area of sports are all of the music and theater and drama and speech and debate. Um, all of those many other ways for students mm -hmm. to excel and um, newspaper and journalism and yearbook. And that has and probably been student driven. It, it is very much student driven uh -huh. and, and then there's a whole level of clubs that are absolutely student interest driven. I re okay. remember telling you that a few years ago there was a fishing club at Southeast <laughs> High School that had 300 students in it. I and I know that club, yes. I, it would be <laughs> astonishing to me that there were 300 kids who were really passionate about yes, fishing but yeah. I have a feeling there were 300 <laughs> students who really wanted to be with whoever was sponsoring that club That's and right. who, where their friends were and so That's those right. it, those areas come and go and it's wonderful that there's an opportunity for students to find something they like and find a place to belong. That's right, that's right. Has the philosophy of teaching changed over the years, do you feel? Well, I think we know much more about teaching than we did when I started teaching 40 years ago. The research now on, on how children learn to read and how children learn to process um, numbers and, and concepts of numeracy is better than it's ever been. So we mm -hmm. simply know more about teaching. Mm -hmm. And I think our expectations for students are higher than they've ever been. Our graduation mm -hmm. requirements are, are higher than mm -hmm. they've ever been. And I think the sense of, of teacher responsibility for individual students is at a much stronger level than it was when I started as a teacher. There was, um, I, I believe there's just a very passionate belief on the part of teachers that mm -hmm. if a student doesn't get it the first time, it's a teacher's responsibility to figure out another way to teach that so the student has a second opportunity. And I think that's stronger than it has been in 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, at the heart of teaching, that hasn't changed though is the relationship between a teacher and a student. Mm -hmm. Students learn better when they like their teachers sure. and teaching is much more enjoyable when you like your students. Absolutely. So I think that emphasis on building relationships and communicating with students and families is unchanged. The importance of it though is better mm -hmm. understood. Well, I agreed, agreed. Um, although as you, you have spent your career in teaching, mm -hmm. I'm certain that you have learned a lot over the years too, watching students and teachers and oh, principals. Yes. What are just a couple of things that you have learned? You know, I just marvel when I watch really good teaching and I marvel when I watch really good administrators at work as they work with all the complexities in a school and figure out how do you put all those pieces together mm -hmm. and, and, and just make it happen. I'm, I've learned a lot also in this community in these 40 years about the strength and and the power of diversity. We are a much more diverse community, much more diverse school district than when I started. Um, when I started this job 25 years ago, I think about 7% of our students were students of color. That figure today is 30%. Oh, wow. And it, it lives throughout our community and our refugee families, our immigrant families, mm -hmm. our African American families, Hispanic families, Asian American, mm -hmm. Native American families. Uh, when you drive up 27th Street, you see restaurants and grocery stores and dance studios and fabric shops that didn't exist 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we're a richer community for it, and I believe that our students are, um, are better served by that also. Absolutely. Uh, one question I wondered, if you could wave a magic wand, what would your wish for the future of education be? Well, um, it would extend beyond the future of education <laughs> because what my wish would be would be that every child um, was born into a home that was safe and stable, that every child had good prenatal care, um, good medical care through, um, through their growing up years, that every child had uh, parents and adults in the home that would read with them and talk with them and interact mm -hmm. with them to help mm -hmm. build those language skills. Um, that every child would have a parent who was able to be an advocate for them and that um, that children were were living in a community where every child had the opportunity to grow up 
I'm straight and true and strong. Absolutely. And if all of those pieces are in place, then um, the magic wand for education is much less needy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Education definitely starts before anyone it sets does. foot it in does. high school. It starts before that child That's is born. Right. That's right. I know the LPS fire destroyed much of your memorabilia, but Indeed. certainly not your memories. That's certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if you might have a special story or two to, to share mm -hmm. with, the, with us that would let us know the personal side of your job. Sure. Well, I, I, I love all the interactions I've had with children and with their families and with all of us who work with them over the years. A couple of students come to mind when you ask that question. One is Michael. I knew Michael as a first grader, and he was one of the students in our very first group of children who were in the Reading Recovery Program. Mm -hmm. And Reading Recovery is a wonderful program that we have for struggling readers in first grade. It, it's a very intense program. Children work with a specially trained teacher one-on-one -on -one for 30 minutes a day, every day for a full semester. And um, there are most at-risk readers who are in that program, and our success rate is that about 88% of those students, when they complete the full program, are reading at grade level. And those are students that were far below grade level when they started. Mm -hmm. So it's a hugely successful program. Yes. We started the program, I believe, in 1997. And at the end of the first year, we thought we should give a report to the Board of Education about the program because it's a costly program. It's, it's an expensive investment, and we wanted, we wanted board members to know what the outcomes were for that investment. Mm -hmm. So um, as we met to plan that, one of the teachers said, why don't we let the children give the report, which mm -hmm. was a stroke mm -hmm. of brilliance and much better than adults talking. Absolutely. So, um, so we did. They, the teachers recruited a few children who'd been in the program, and they came down to to the old LPSDO and they were in the boardroom, which is a mighty forbidding place, <laughs> even for adults, let alone for children. But at the time that the children were to, to come forward for their, for their part of the report, we had eight children who were going to each stand beside a school board member and our superintendent and um, read to them, showing mm -hmm. the reading mm -hmm. skills that they had gained. Well, one of our school board members was absent that day, so Michael ended up standing beside <laughs> me, and it was my lucky day. And um, so Michael came and stood beside me, and had, he had a poetry book. It was a great, big, fat poetry anthology. And um, he, he kind of looked up at me, and then he looked at my lap, and I said, if you want to, so he climbs on my lap, which is perfect. And for him and for me and for every viewer, I think, who saw it. And uh, he opened his book of poetry and turned to the poem that he had prepared to read, and he read it perfectly, of course. And then, um, and then he kind of thumbed through the book and looked back up at me and thumbed through the book again and looked at, back up at me again and said, and I can read all of the rest of them too. Oh, well, my. heartbreaking moment because yes. What Michael said in those few words demonstrated that he knew that when he started, he couldn't read them all, mm -hmm. and now that he can, and he knows that he's a reader, and a child who sees himself as a reader will pick up every book that comes before mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. and he'll keep reading, which will help him be a better and better Absolutely. reader. Absolutely. So Michael's, Michael's words to me are, are just, um, just embedded in my heart because they're so tender, and they were so true, and he was so cute. That is absolutely wonderful, <laughs> it Marilyn. It's a wonderful story. <laughs> I'm going to remember that story. I love Thank that story. Thank you for sharing that with us today. That's wonderful. When you started to think about your retirement, what did you think that might look like for you? Well, I thought I would, um, I thought I would have time to travel and that I would have time to clean closets and drawers. Every <laughs> woman I know hopes they have time to clean closets and drawers. That I would have, um, you know, just a, a more leisurely life, time uh -huh. to have lunch with uh -huh. friends and, and do more exercise and spend more time with my husband and visit our family. And, and I hope to teach some classes at the university. So I was mm -hmm. kind of putting all those pieces together. That's what I thought retirement would look like. Sure. And instead, what and will instead, you be doing? shortly after I announced my retirement, I was asked by the board of the Brian College of Brian L G H College of Health Sciences if I would come be their college president. So, starting September first, that's what I will be doing. Oh, wow. So, I'll have a couple of months for that little retirement picture that I had in <laughs> mind, and, and then I'll start the next adventure. So, instead of retiring, you're going to start another. <laughs> career. I will start another <laughs> career, and I don't know what it will be, but I think it will still be all about teaching and learning and leadership, and um, and the community of Lincoln will be far the better for it. Oh, Marilyn, thank, we you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. I understand you're going to be a cover girl on Live and Learn. That's what I've heard. Issue. So everyone, get your copies of Live and Learn <laughs> and read the wonderful story about Marilyn. Oh, that will be you're fun. Very deserving of that honor. Marilyn, your job as superintendent for instruction includes much more than just sitting behind a desk. We have a photo of you on a trip that you were able to make, and I know that poster was one of the few articles of memorabilia mm -hmm. that was not destroyed by the fire. It's Could true. you please tell us about that? 
That was a wonderful trip. My husband and I went with the Lincoln Youth Symphony last mm -hmm. spring to Hungary and Austria where the Youth Symphony performed a number of times. And that particular poster is from their performance at St. Michael's Church in Budapest. Oh, wow. And the poster's in Hungarian, which of course I can't read, but I was there <laughs> so I know what it says. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That, that must have been a fantastic trip. It was an amazing experience. We love traveling with high schoolers and we love being with musicians, so it was, oh, it was the perfect trip. I can imagine, it I can imagine. Wonderful. We have one other picture. Uh, when I visited you in February, you had a very cute birdhouse house sitting it's on your true. desk. I just loved it and you were good enough to bring it today. It looks just slightly different. It does. <laughs> and could you please tell us about this? Yes, the pictures before and this is the after. <laughs> I'm, this is a part of a fundraiser project for Habitat for Humanity, a, a really wonderful organization in town that helps people build houses who could otherwise never afford to live in a home. Mm -hmm. And as part of this fundraiser, a number of people in the community were contacted and asked to take a birdhouse and to okay. decorate it in some way illustrative of their work. Okay. And the, the folks at Habitat for Humanity are using it um, around the community and it, it, they're raising money in some yes. good way. I don't know what it all is. <laughs> this is, um, uh, we call it the right house. Um, it's a number two pencil, which if there's any, any object that symbolizes schools and classrooms still, it would be the number two number pencil. Two. And I take no credit for it other than being fortunate enough to have mm -hmm. a, a wonderful colleague whose daughter, Erin um, Scott, is an art teacher okay. um, in another community. And she looked at it and said, oh, of course, it's a pencil. So she spent a weekend mixing colors to get exactly the right colors and to um, to create the right house. So I'm very grateful to Aaron Scott for creating the right house and, and grateful for um, Habitat for Humanity and their work and glad to be a part of it. Absolutely, that's wonderful, Marilyn, thank, thank you. you. I had just one really quick final thought to share with us as we ended our interview. Could well, you share that with us today? I, I think that children and their learning is the most important work that happens in this school district every single day. Um, 36,000 children of all ages are learning and growing working with skilled and competent teachers, and it has been truly my honor to be a part of that for 40 years. I, I am richly blessed. Oh, thank you, Marilyn. Thank We've been you. richly blessed by having you with us today. Thank, thank you. you. And we will be right back. Lincoln loves its trees. Now you can show your support through the Two for Trees program. Just voluntarily add $2 to your Lincoln Water System bill. Each donation is matched by the Kenneth J. Good Endowed Fund of the Lincoln Community Foundation, as well as local nurseries and garden centers. Through Two for Trees, your donations will help plant and care for trees along streets and in parks. See what you and two can do. Visit twofortrees.org. Two for Trees! Welcome back to Live and Learn. I'm Dolores Lintel, I'm one of the hosts, and I have as my guest today, June Peterson, who is the Director of Aging Partners. And we have a lot of good things to talk about today. Uh, first, we have the uh, Living Fe Lifelong Living Festival that will be coming up, and um, also we'll talk later then about Lincoln Cares and the new information and programs that we'll offer. So um, let's begin with the, the festival and where, when, and give me all the information <laughs> about it. The Lifelong Living Festival is a program that's been happening for decades now. Mm -hmm. People in Lincoln are very familiar with this. It comes in the spring. This year it's going to be May 5, which okay. is Cinco de Mayo. Okay. So we're having a festival for the Lifelong Living Festival. That'll be fun. They'll be decorating and they'll be doing all sorts of interesting things. Mm -hmm. It's going to be at the Lancaster Event Center. Mm -hmm. Parking is free. It begins at 8 o'clock in the morning and ends at 2. Okay. And there are lots of things that go on during that time. Okay. Well, just lead us, lead us through a day. There's all kinds of vendors and there's entertainment, there's information booths. Why would I want to go to the Lifelong Living Festival? Ah, uh, well, if you were interested in what your blood readings might be, maybe you haven't had a cholesterol test for a long time and you'd mm -hmm. like to do that, you can have that done that morning. They're mm -hmm. gonna open up the health screening part of the festival at 7.30. Okay. These tests work at any point in time, but they work better if you come fasting. fasting. Right, okay. And I said, and will there be food if you come hungry? And they said, of course, there'll be a concession stand so okay. you can eat. But that's an opportunity to get a number of blood screenings. Certainly. 
the aging partners health staff is going mm -hmm. to do a number of things. They're going to do a senior fitness test, which is an opportunity for you to do a number of activities, stretching, leaning over, maybe standing on one foot to see how healthy you are. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that test, they will give you some exercises you could do at home oh. or at the fit fitness center. Okay. So that's, that's another opportunity to become more aware of sure. your own personal health. Yeah. So we're looking and forward to that. if there's some problem, then they would know they have to deal with it. That's right. That's okay. right. They're going to do posture screenings mm -hmm. for those of us that need to sit up straight. Mm -hmm. And they're also going to do um, a glaucoma outreach. Creighton mm -hmm. University is going to provide someone to come and talk to people about that mm -hmm. and maybe do some light testing. So if, if you've worried about that and you'd mm -hmm. like some, some confirmation or some reassurance, mm -hmm. that'd be another opportunity to mm -hmm. do that. And then the list of vendors mm -hmm. is significant. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of things. There are people who uh, offer information about uh, things that make growing older easier tools, uh, those ads you see on television mm -hmm. for those walk-in bathtubs, okay. there'll be one there. Mm -hmm. You can find out how that works. Okay. Uh, there'll be chiropractors and health professionals. There'll mm -hmm. be people who just simply want to sell you something that might make your life easier mm -hmm. or more interesting. Or solve a problem that you've really been searching to get a solution to that, it, and they that think, oh, too. this would work. And the fire department staff will be there to mm -hmm. take your blood pressure. And do they have, I think one year they had bone density screenings? and They those? will likely do that too. Mm -hmm. yes. All those things are, yes. are helpful. Our aging partner staff does mm -hmm. that. Okay, now it, will there be entertainment too? There will. They have a magician booked. They have a number of other things booked. They're working on a series of entertainment followed by a seminar on an issue that will be of interest and more entertainment. And that will take place throughout the day. They'll start that 9, 30, 10 o'clock mm -hmm. and conclude that at 2. Okay. And I suppose that Aging Partners will have um, a booth there with information with all the things that you offer. It wouldn't be the Lifelong no. Festival without <laughs> Aging Partners. <laughs> Staff will be there to answer questions about everything that you might want to know about mm -hmm. aging. Uh, our staff from the care management team will be there. We'll have those from the senior centers. Mm -hmm. We'll have everyone there and information that mm -hmm. you can take home with you to share with your parents or with friends and family or for yourself. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll have the usual giveaways. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Little prizes here and there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, there's, cer there's certainly a lot of information and, and the entertainment and everything will make it just fun. Fun it, to have it'll a day be a, there. A great day. And I see you have a poster that I um, do. here that you can. This poster mm -hmm. has been printed in the uh, newsletter for okay. the senior centers, okay. and it will also appear in the April issue of Living Well, the spring issue. So that'll be fun, and it tells you about that, mm -hmm. and reminds you that if you're going to do a health screening at the show, mm -hmm. you'll want to come fasting, right. or uh, you can do it anyway, but they suggest mm -hmm. that that's a better way to do that. Mm -hmm. And then you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so the vendors will cover a range from healthcare products to, um, I suppose there will be insurance companies, people who can help you with your uh, wills and, and all of the documents that you should be having taken care of. All that good advice that uh -huh. you need to know before that crisis happens. Sure, be prepared uh, the, for anything. The mortuaries, mm -hmm. funeral homes are always there to help you mm -hmm. answer questions and help you make plans when it's not a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's certainly something to look forward to, and it's been an enjoyable time. I've been there several times, and it's just it's just fun to it is. take part in it everything. Is. And the hosts have been helpful. We okay. often do a survey and let you wander around and ask people questions, and we mm -hmm. find out a lot of things that way, mm -hmm. too. And it, it gives uh, in, uh, opportunity for people to ask questions and give you some input on what they think is necessary and That's what correct. services that That's should correct. be provided. We always want to know what people are thinking, mm -hmm. what they need, what interests them, mm -hmm. and that changes. Oh, yes. 
Okay, and then the other thing that we wanted to talk about is I understand that Mayor Beitler has just announced uh, the expansion of the Lincoln Cares program. Yes. Would you like to tell us about that and how it affects aging partners? I'd be pleased. Yesterday, I took part in a press conference that included the mayor, the parks director, and the libraries director. Mm -hmm. Lincoln Cares is a program that started in 2003. You can, if you wish, add a dollar each month that you pay your LES bill. Mm -hmm. And up until now, that dollar has gone to support programs that the parks have put together. The Sunken Gardens was the premier program that that money funded. Now, the program is being expanded. Mm -hmm. And Aging Partners and the Lincoln City Libraries are also going to be involved oh, as recipients okay. of some of that donation. So we're very excited about mm -hmm. that. The Parks has lots of projects and the library has a wonderful Learn to Read project. Mm -hmm. Aging Partners project is designed to help a small group of people who are aging in place, who live alone on a fixed income, have no family or friends that can come and help with things like snow removal, Hard to talk about snow removal this particular March, but remember last year. Yeah. Snow removal, lawn care, maybe there's a faucet in your house that drips and your water bill is increasing because of that. Yet you, you're hesitant to call a plumber mm -hmm. and have them come and fix that. We're going to use this donation fund to support mm -hmm. making those snow removals more possible for them and helping mm -hmm. with lawn care and, and those small at-home projects. Mm -hmm. These are people who have worked all their lives. They're self-sufficient. They can live in their homes much, much longer. Mm -hmm. But those unexpected expenses mm -hmm. make it difficult. Yeah. So yes. it's a donation-driven program. Mm -hmm. We don't have a city budget for that. Okay. And this will. This is a wonderful opportunity to mm -hmm. add to that donation so fund. So it's a program that's now in place, but this will give you additional funds yes. and enhance what yes. you're able. To. We have a waiting list, mm -hmm. and it'll be wonderful mm -hmm. if we don't have to have people wait. Yeah. Well, so. and it's a it's a useful program to help these people solve the problems that are just. A little bit troublesome, but they they still need to live in their home and enjoy what they've had. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So we're very pleased to be yeah. part of the Lincoln Cares program. And when will that uh, program kick in? If s someone may have got received a bill already, the okay. stuffers so are in the bills telling so them about the change in the program and so that it's they can going apply on right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. I think uh, it's a good program, and this I certainly think so will too. help it stay in place a lot longer. Yeah. We're very pleased. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much, June. I think you've given us a lot of good information, and I appreciate the time that you've taken to do this. Thank you. And I'll look forward to seeing our audience at the Cinco de Mayo, May 5th, Lifelong, Lifelong Living, Living Festival. Festival. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and remember that it's never too late to live and to learn. Mm -hmm.